A witch called Huddle lived in a wood in a very damp cottage. She spent most of her time trying to bring off some strong magic. She was not bad at working small spells for this and that, mostly slightly nasty, such as giving people colds or turning milk sour or making horses cast their shoes. But the really big stuff was beyond her. Mostly she couldn't even get it started. On the very few occasions she did, the results were unexpected. A love potion became a shower of bad cabbage water. A spell for youth and beauty, for herself, merely turned her hair green. She was a failure at sorcery, and she got crosser and crosser. What I need, she told herself one day, is a demon, a nice tame one, to be my slave and tell me what to do and how to do it. Then I'll take my rightful place in the world as a great and evil witch. She drew a deep breath, unlocked a cupboard, and took out her grandmother's book of black magic. It looked horrible, covered with mould and cobwebs and smelling peculiar. She had never touched it before. It made her feel faint just to look at it. But having set her mind on a demon, she gritted her teeth, shuddered a few times and opened it. She found a chapter on demons. It was frightful. The book gave a deep groan that made her scream. But she nerved herself to look again and found a simple sort of spell that she thought she could handle. Boldness now, said Huddle, egging herself on. It looks an easy little spell. Let's see how it goes. If you want a demon slave who will never misbehave, one as gentle as a mouse, clean and quiet about the house, efficacious without fuss, you must go about it thus. And then followed a list of curious things to be used in calling the demon. Things like soot, salt, seaweed and sesame oil. There were complicated instructions for preparing these and a rhymed spell to say for each as it went into the pot. Lovely, easy, child's play, ha ha ha, said Huddle. This time it's going to work without any surprises. But she should have read the rhymes more carefully. When she'd collected all the components and set them to hand on the table, she put her biggest pot on the fire. Carefully consulting the book, she poured, added and mixed in the ingredients, saying for each its little rhyme as it went in. This took quite a time. At last, the room began to fill with evil-smelling steam. Thick, oily little bubbles were forming and popping in the cauldron. Huddle was too excited to notice how sinister it all looked. She had a big wooden spoon, and after giving her cooking a good stir, she licked a splash from her finger. Although it was steaming and frothing, the stuff seemed as cold as ice, and the taste... Eh! cried the witch, and fainted. When she recovered, she sat up and looked about her for her good, quiet demon slave. She couldn't see across the room for steam, but from somewhere came a soft laugh. Huddle nearly fainted again. Oh, my word, she gasped. I've done it. I've got one. The laugh came again. It sounded spiteful. Some wisps of steam eddied aside, and there, in the centre of the table, sat a yellow cat. Oh, said Huddle. Are you... Uh, uh, oh, law. Cold shivers were running up and down her spine. The yellow cat was huge, and its eyes shone like green stones, and it laughed. Don't laugh at me, said Huddle, feebly. Uh, why not, said the cat. Ooh, you can talk. Naturally, said the cat. My name is Victor, and when I see something comical, I laugh. Do you indeed, said the witch, trying to seem bold. Well, if you're going to be my slave, I won't allow... Uh, just a moment, interrupted Victor. Do I look like a slave? You look like a cat. And are cats easily enslaved? I suppose not. But you're a demon, said Huddle. Not a real cat. I've just done a very strong spell to summon a demon, and you're it. I'm it. But you've got everything back to front as usual. I'm not your slave, dear, said Victor. You are mine. Read the first line of the first part of that spell again. Especially note the position of the first comma. Hurrying to the book on the table, Huddle looked. If you want a demon, slave, who will... She tried to say something and failed. The cat watched her, smiling. And suddenly she was overcome by terror. She rushed to the door, wrenched it open and fled into the night. Oh, come back, called the cat. No, never. I won't be a demon slave, shrieked Huddle. She ran even faster. Then came a swirl of wind around her, and she was back inside the cottage with the door slammed shut. Let's not be silly, said Victor. You can never escape. Now, get me my supper. Some filleted sole, a bowl of cream, 
I'm not fussy about my food as long as it's delicious. There's nothing like that in my larder, said Huddle. There is now, said the cat, and there was. Huddle got his supper. From then on, she was forced to work very hard. The cat insisted that she should scrub and dust and whitewash the cottage. He wanted the floors polished and the windows washed. He demanded new curtains, new cushion covers. He made Huddle knit him a green and white rug for his bed. He was fussy about the way his food was served. He nearly drove the witch into a nervous breakdown. When he decided the place looked reasonably habitable, he brought some friends to stay. There was a white owl called, for some reason, Poodle, a black rat with red eyes and white whiskers, whose name was Avis, an enormous thin dog with silvery fur and an iron collar with the name Bertie engraved on it, and a big beetle who did not seem to be called anything. Poodle, Bertie, Avis, Victor and the beetle all ate hugely. The witch really had to slave to look after them. They all had curious fads and fancies about the methods of cooking and dishing up. Huddle was tired and miserable. She was absolutely fed up with a lot of them. One night, as they lay on the green and white rug, gorged with food, Huddle put her hands on her hips, scowled at them and said, Is there no way to get rid of you? Get rid of us, they said. Don't you like us? She gritted her teeth. I adore you, she said untruthfully. But uh, I'd rather live alone as I used to do. I prefer it. Really, drawled Victor. Then why did you summon a demon? It, uh, it was a mistake. And the cat looked at her thoughtfully. Then he said, uh, there's an, only one way to free yourself, Draggle. Huddle, snapped the witch. Uh, whatever your name is, your only chance is to find the sky blue whistling spark, said Victor. Produce that, and I and all my friends will go like lambs. Uh, then uh, would you mind repeating? Find the sky blue whistling spark. The spark for living, the blue for happiness, the whistle for hope. Uh, not difficult, said the cat, if you know where to look. Uh, but I don't, cried Huddle. You'll have to tell me where to search for it. Why should we help, asked Poodle, stretching his wings. We're happy enough with things as they are, said Avis. I dare say, snarled the witch, but it won't be that easy for me, searching the wide world for this sky blue, whatever it is. Uh, you won't be searching, smiled Victor. You'll be staying at home here, looking after us. You must find another to do your searching, dear. Her mouth and eyes round with horror, Huddle cried, Who? Who would do anything for me? Everyone in the neighbourhood hates me. They call me a nasty cross old witch. And aren't you, said the cat. Huddle gave a sob of despair. I wanted to be one, she wailed. I wanted to make people frightened of me, but now, when I need help so badly. Ah, that's when you need friends, missus, said the rat. The others nudged one another rapturously. I'll tell you what, said Victor. I'll give you half an hour to go out and find somebody to help you. That's a fair offer. A whole half hour. It's now seven o'clock. If you're not back by half past to get our supper, I'll send something utterly horrible to fetch you. How's that? Oh, dearie, dearie me, wailed Huddle. And off she went into the pouring rain and the dark wet woods to find someone, anyone, to help her rid herself of her demon masters. It was hopeless. First the woodcutter turned her away, then the gypsies laughed at her. And women going home glared angrily when she spoke to them. Keep away from us, you grouchy, quarrelsome thing, shouted one. The witch sat down on a muddy bank and burst into tears. She thought of that bunch of demons waiting in her cottage for their food, about the cooking, the washing up. She thought how tired and lonely she was, with no friends to pity her. She cried and cried. In her misery and through her tears, she didn't hear the sound of footsteps on the wet ground. She gasped in surprise when a voice spoke. What's the matter? it said. Standing beside her was a rough-looking fellow. His clothes were ragged, and one of his hands was wrapped in a dirty bandage. Are you hurt, old dear? said he. No, I'm not, snarled the witch. And if you're begging, save yourself the bother. I've no money for you, and no time to be listening to any lying, hard-luck story. Don't worry, said the man quietly. I'm not begging. I'm back from foreign wars, wounded and hungry, but not begging. I do small jobs at the farms I pass, just for a crust of bread and a glass of ale. You'll get no bread or ale from me. Be off, said Huddle spitefully. No call to speak so unfriendly, said he. Thought you might be needing help, that's all. He limped off slowly down the path, and the witch suddenly realised just what he had said. She gave a great gasp and ran after him. Oh, please, oh, please, come back. Please, please stop, she cried. 
She caught up with him and whispered, I'm sorry, forgive me. I'm a nasty, horrible old woman. They're right to hate me, but uh, I'm in so much trouble. The man looked at her white face, all streaked with tears and rain. He saw the marks of temper and pride and conceit round her mouth and eyes. He saw her thin grey hair and the shaking skinny hands. Oh, well, tell me all about it then, he said. And she blurted out the whole terrible story. So there it is, she ended. Now I suppose you'll laugh at me. I'll deserve it too. Not just because of all the stupid things I've done before, but for being unkind to you. It was gentle to me. You poor old woman, said the man. I'll take you home and see if I can sort things out a bit. So back they went together to the cottage. Once inside, the two of them stood and looked at the demons. The great cat narrowed his eyes at the man. Aren't you afraid? said Victor softly. Yes, said the man. Of course I am. Demons are terrible things to face, but... Well, whatever the danger, I'm going to try and get you out of this house. And how, purred the yellow cat. There was a pause. According to Mistress Huddle, said the man slowly, it seems there's only one way. And can you find the way, asked the cat. Do you know where to look for a sky-blue whistling spark? Do you, Thomas? The man looked surprised at the use of his name. Then he remembered that he was dealing with demons. He thought deeply for a few minutes while the others watched him. Then he said, I'm not clever or handsome or wise, but whatever I can do, that I will do to find this spark and free the old woman from your power. Victor laughed softly. Uh, there's only one way for you, Thomas, said he. You must become my slave. Then I'll release Huddle. There followed a long silence in the cottage. The fire burned brightly on the hearth, though not as brightly as the eyes of the demons. And at last, Thomas nodded his head. Very well, said he. At this, Huddle stamped her foot and said she wouldn't allow it. She touched Thomas's hand gently and smiled at him. Thank you, my dear, she said. But you shan't do it, no. They'd run you off your poor feet waiting on them. I'd rather slave the rest of my life than have a decent, kind fellow like you saddled with these layabouts. She marched to the larder door, her head high and angry. I'll get some food for you, Thomas, lad, said she, and I'll give you my blessings for what they're worth and my true thanks, and you can be on your way and think no more of me and my silly problems. She opened the larder door. She opened the lid of the bread crock, and a great blue spark shot across the room, as blue as a summer sky. Twice round the room it went, whistling. And then it turned into a shower of rainbow spangles down the wall. And one by one, the animals turned into lambs and vanished. Only the yellow cat still sat on the table, smiling. Are you sure you want me to go? He said. Suppose I offer to stay and help you make magic. No, said Huddle. No more spells and sorcery for me. I don't want to be a witch. I'd rather be ordinary and live kindly and have friends. That's all I needed to know, said Victor. I'll be on my way. He turned into a lamb and then disappeared. Huddle heaved a great sigh of relief. She turned to Thomas. Sit by the fire, lad, she told him. I'll make a nice cup of tea. But first, she got all her magic books, including her grands, and dumped them in the middle of the fire. Then she went to fill the kettle. Goodbye.